Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, having us today. I'm really excited to be able to uh, talk about transportation equity in the context of autonomous vehicles. We have a fantastic panel, um, and our plan for the next hour or so is for our great presenters, who I will introduce, to uh, provide some background on the research that they have been conducting and the work they've been doing. And then we'll follow that up with some questions, uh, both from me and from the audience. So uh, I'd like to go ahead and get started with um, Jackie Cusio, who is an assistant transportation researcher uh, in the infrastructure investment analysis program at the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. She is also working towards her PhD in urban and regional science at Texas A&M. Her research interests lie at the intersections of transportation technology and equity, in particular, how planning can equitably introduce emerging transportation technologies. In addition, her research examines how transportation investments and technological development, such as autonomous vehicles and artificial intelligence, can both help and hinder equitable transportation. So Jackie, I'd like to go ahead and, and pass the uh, baton to you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. And so um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about my research. Most of this is what I do um, as part of my PhD at Texas A&M University, but um, kind of just a high level overview of what um, I do generally. And so a lot of it is getting at that question of how we can plan for an equitable future with transportation technologies. So understanding that these technologies can be highly disruptive, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, our current transportation system isn't perfect. And so, you know, certain disruption might be useful, but kind of who are we disrupting? What are those populations that are being affected and how are they being affected? Is it a positive change or is it a negative one? And so to try and get at that, I look at kind of past and current technology investments to see kind of what are the previous equity challenges or opportunities have been and kind of how we can develop a strategy moving forward that incorporates equity. And so we're not only improving our transportation system as a whole, but we're making sure that those populations that have previously been harmed by um, transportation investments or developments kind of have their transportation improved. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a study that I completed in um, about 2018. Um, so it's called Planning for Social Equity in Emerging Technologies. And I looked at kind of three questions um, in terms of metropolitan planning organizations and what they were including in their long range transportation plans, also called regional transportation plans. So I was looking for how they were addressing equity more broadly, how they were preparing and planning for emerging technologies and um, whether they were considering kind of the equity of those emerging technologies as well. So I looked at 20, so it's quite a small sample of uh, these transportation plans, all of which were completed in 2016 and 2017. And I used kind of content analysis techniques to do that. And so I'm going to focus on the findings that I have from that third question about kind of, are we considering the equity of emerging technologies? And so what I found with the only 20% so far of the plans that I looked at actually discussed these issues. Um, mostly in terms of kind of autonomous vehicles specifically. Um, Atlanta actually had kind of a broader discussion um, and they had a research study on kind of transportation technologies and how that was going to impact their entire transportation system. But they did discuss kind of some of the equity benefits um, and especially in terms of increased accessibility for a senior and um, people with disability and people with disabilities. Um, and they had some kind of policy guidelines in that document. Um, and then kind of taking a different um, tack, Cleveland, Ohio actually talked about kind of the economic losses because the trucking industry is a major employer. So they were thinking about how automation of that industry would have an effect on their region as a whole and how maybe those kind of job losses and then potentially subsequent population losses would impact their transportation needs um, and planning and investment priorities. Um, and so that was an interesting take on kind of what's um, kind of the broader impacts of these technologies on society as a whole beyond maybe just kind of how we move around. And then finally, um, both Madison and Tulsa kind of took it that one step further and we're trying to use technologies to really, to really improve equity in their um, region. So 
They both had a project or a plan to use autonomous vehicles or autonomous shuttles to increase accessibility for both kind of senior and disabled populations. And so um, I do have some kind of research ongoing that um, one of those is an expansion of that study that I just talked about, where I'm taking kind of a deeper dive into social equity, environmental justice, and kind of how um, MPOs or um, these planning agencies across the US are considering the equity of different types of technologies and maybe how their strategy differs. And then I'm wrapping up a study that kind of gets at that what, how, what can we learn from past technology investments, maybe what are some of the mistakes we've made or some of actually the benefits that we've seen from these. And then finally, I'm hoping to deploy a survey very soon that kind of looks at what maybe is happening outside of these planning documents and kind of seeing what planners themselves think about kind of equity challenges and equity benefits of these technologies and how we can kind of provide some broad advice for maybe smaller or mid-sized regions as we move forward. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really looking forward to digging into that. And uh, it's exciting to see all this great work you're putting forward just as a PhD student. Um, it's really exciting. Uh, so now I'd like to move on to Aaron McCurry, who is the project manager of accessibility at May Mobility, where she defines and executes on the company's accessibility roadmap. She previously served as a technical program manager, leading releases of new software and hardware features to the May Mobility fleet. She first joined May as a test engineer and helped develop standards and procedures for testing the autonomy stack. Prior to joining May Mobility, she worked at EPA, where she analyzed emissions and driving trend data. She graduated from Eastern Michigan with a BS in electronics engineering technology. So I'll pass it on to you, Erin. Hi, thank you. Um, so I will just go ahead and share my screen. OK, can you all see this? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so uh, like Yuna said, I am Ann McCurry. I'm the product manager for accessibility at May Mobility. Um, and I'm just here to talk today about autonomous vehicles and transportation equity and uh, some of the things that, that May Mobility has been doing to um, ensure that our vehicles are developed uh, in a way that is accessible um, to not only people with disabilities, but also uh, to communities or, or people who uh, have may otherwise be, be left out of the autonomous vehicle um, revolution. So just some background on May Mobility. Um, we are a self-driving shuttle startup based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, we operate low speed autonomous shuttles, um, which you should be able to see here. Uh, and we, we do everything with these vehicles. So we develop the autonomy, autonomy software, um, we run the operations, and then we, we do significant retrofits to the vehicles. Um, for some context on, on you know, where we're operating and, and why we, we feel that, that uh, we, we, could, we can speak about this, um, we've launched pilots in four cities um, with three more routes coming in 2021. Um, so we've actually launched two of those routes in um, Higashi, Hiroshima, Japan, and Arlington, Texas so far this year. Um, and we have a launch coming up in Indianapolis that we are looking forward to. Um, so I, I wanted to go back and kind of talk about the promise of AVs and you know how historically we've talked about autonomous vehicles and how they can um, benefit people with disabilities, people who otherwise would not be able to, to um, uh, move independently, basically. So AVs have this have this promise of being able to unlock transportation independence um, for people who otherwise wouldn't be able to drive themselves or um, you know get get on their own bus. Um, transportation becomes more affordable when you when you you know remove the driver and you can uh, put your resources elsewhere. Um, there's also this goal of, you know, using AVs with electric powertrains to reduce public health effects of uh, congestion and vehicle emissions. Um, if more people have access to clean transportation, um, if more people uh, use shared transportation, that uh, reduces a lot of these um, urban planning uh, and public health effects that, that we see so often. Um, 
But something that uh, we think is very important to stress and that, uh, you know, we haven't seen a ton of, I think, is um, companies understanding that these promises can only be fulfilled through working together with these target end, user, end users and communities and including them in the development of AVs. Um, so I wanted to talk about, you know, as an AV company, as people are thinking about um, starting AV deployments, uh, where are the challenges and what are the opportunities that that we can, you know, realize some of these uh, promises that that we've talked about for so long? Um, one big area is is just knowing uh, the challenges associated with retrofitting a vehicle versus making your own purpose built vehicle. So. There's a lot of AV companies who have, who have invested a lot of time and money into creating their own vehicles for their autonomous vehicle deployments. Um, however, we haven't seen a lot of those, those vehicles prioritize accessibility, um, which is something that, you know, if, if you want to operate a shared transportation service, if you want to be able to fulfill this promise of transportation independence, it's, it's crucial. Um, Another another way that you know AV companies and cities can can start the journey to to achieving accessible AVs is just through partnerships and local engagement, just with communities, with disability advocacy groups, with people with disabilities. Um, May Mobility at at each of our sites, we try to hold uh, some kind of disability awareness workshop, um, just connecting with members of the community showing them our vehicles, showing them our service, um, and then just asking for feedback. I think, I think that that's you know, a great first step for AV companies um, when you're thinking about this. Um, also, you know, treating deployments as a long-term transportation project rather than a like, year-long pilot, um, that's a great way to just, just think about you know, how you want your service to help the community five years from now, 10 years from now, planning for that long-term success rather than um, you know, look, we had an AV for a year. Um, I think that it's also crucial to uh, think about how AVs can help uh, tr fill transportation gaps in lower income communities um, and rural communities as well. So making sure that, uh, you know, when, when, we're when we're planning um, a route that, you know, we're not just focused in this downtown area, you know, we're actually, uh, giving giving the community more transportation options um so th these are just what we've what we've kind of come up with as our our playbook for uh using AVs to try to achieve transportation equity um but excited to to continue the conversation on this hey fantastic thank you Erin um I personally am excited to be able to take a ride in one of your vehicles <laughs> sometime soon you have to bring them to Washington yeah um so now we're going to move on to uh, Brandon Pitts, who's assistant professor in the School of Industrial Engineering, director of the Next Generation Human Systems and Cognitive Engineering Lab, and faculty associate with the Center on Aging and the Life Course, all at Purdue University in West Lafayette in Indiana. He received a BS in Industrial Engineering from Louisiana State in 2010, and an MSE and PhD in Industrial and Operations Engineering from the University of Michigan in 2013 and 2016, respectively. Prior to his faculty appointment, he was a research fellow in the University of Michigan Center for Healthcare Engineering and Patient Safety. Dr. Pitt's research interests are in areas of human factors and cognitive ergonomics, human automation interaction, context-sensitive interface design, and gerund technology in complex transportation and work environments, such as driving and aviation. His lab has several government and industry funded projects related to next gen autonomous systems. He's a member of the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society and the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers. He's also a registered engineer intern. So I'll pass it on to you, Brandon. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. And I'm also going to share my screen. All right, is everyone seeing this? Okay, fantastic. Um, so I'm actually glad to follow Erin because um, a lot of what she talked about has some overlaps with, with what I'm kind of what my research area is and my interests are. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about older adults and um, equitable autonomous vehicles. You can see some of the images that I took from 
the internet to kind of show what this space looks like and the things that we need to be thinking about. Uh, but in the introduction, uh, they mentioned that I was the director of this enhanced research lab. And what we're really doing is trying to um, either design or redesign interfaces to support people in a wide variety of contexts. Okay? Um, our primary domain is in driving, uh, but we've got work in aviation and healthcare. And we primarily focus on older adults who we believe many of which have been left out of the product design conversation, just as Aaron mentioned with people uh, related to people with a variety of disabilities. Um, and so you may ask why are we so interested in older adults? Well, if you look nationally, but also worldwide, uh, as of 2016, this is an alarming statistic. Um, in 2016, we reached a point where there were more people turning 65 and older each day than there were babies being born. Okay, that's in the US, but we see a rapid trend uh, happening across the world where there is, are these concerns about um, how do you make sure that technology use and accessibility, uh, all of that is equitable as it relates to uh, um, non-homogenous older adult population. So what I wanna do is talk through a few studies here. Um, I wanna talk through just a few studies that, so if I go back here, um, my computer is giving me a message, sorry about this. Um, one of the things that's, that's important to note is that, as I mentioned, older adults are not the same. And so, for example, there may be someone who's 75 years of age that runs marathons, for which I've never run. Um, but you may have somebody who's 65, 10 years younger than that person, um, with abilities that are less than those of the 75 year old. And so we really have to look at these individual differences and what we call non-chronological age factors. Uh, but to date, there have been very few studies that have assessed um, how potentially useful autonomous vehicles would be for an older population. And you can imagine that um, a lot of the findings conflict one another. So this was a survey that was done with 173 older adults um, and what they found was actually a low percentage of them expressed uh, this feeling that if autonomous rides were available, they would likely make more trips to the stores and community events, um, in other words, changing their behavior. But in that same survey, they reported that 80 to 85% already make five to uh, five or more trips to the grocery store and four or more trips to medical facilities, churches, and a community service event. So this was one of the studies that showed that there is some interest in, in changing behavior, but it wasn't overwhelming. Um, there are some positive um, notes that have been made regarding purchasing autonomous vehicles. So when asked about it, um, most older people say that if there is some type of traditional mode where they can still actually be in manual control or manually control the vehicle, then they may be interested in that kind of an autonomous future. Um, there was another interesting study that asked older adults to rate on a, on a seven point Likert scale uh, their attitudes their, uh, towards the autonomous vehicles. So this was basically feelings that they got, questions, um, questions asked related to if they thought that autonomous vehicles were good for them, if they were desirable to them, if they were pleasant, if, if they could assist. Um, they were also asked about the perceived usefulness, to what extent could autonomous vehicles improve safety and decrease accidents? Um, to what extent did, did they trust them? Uh, to, to what extent were the current um, technological and physical infrastructures set up to support the, develop, uh, the use of autonomous vehicles, as well as an overall measure of acceptance? But one of the things that I wanna highlight in this study is that even though this was on a, a Likert scale from one to seven, um, and there were some significant findings, um, you can see that most people tend, tended to be closer to neutral. Okay, so we don't have this, this over, um, over exciting, uh, over excitement feeling from people um, in the older population. There was another study that looked at more generational con constructs, which basically thought about a, a particular decade or decades for which people were born, right? So a silent generation, would be those that were, uh, who would be um, at most 85 years of age, baby boomers, 
who were born between um, 1946 and 64, Generation X, and then Millennials. And what they found, this was surveying over a thousand people. What they found was that when asked if you prefer that your vehicle has some kind of new technology or the latest technology, 60% um, of the oldest generation did not agree that that, that, that was important to them. Um, when asked about concerns with respect to potential hacking of, of autonomous vehicles, um, we see that 80% of the two oldest groups, as well as 75% of the two youngest groups uh, express some kind of concerns with uh, cyber attacks. So we don't see much difference there. But overall, when asked about their willingness to accept, we see that uh, the younger generation was much more accepting than the, than the older. And then just finally here, uh, this was an interesting study that was done in Canada that looked at different modes of transportation. And um, I apologize that the way that this table is structured, but I've highlighted here the things that I think are important to take away is that when asked about the extent to which uh, people are interested in, in sharing rides with passengers, most people, well, the largest percentage of people said that it wasn't important to them. Uh, they also commented that public transit was not important. Um, ride sharing and anything that, that has to do with um, kind of pre-scheduling pay-as-you-go services. And so I think that we really have to be thinking about what are the implications of people kind of feeling this way. And if we want this autonomous vehicle uh, future to be a reality, we have to think about what are, what are the barriers. Uh, final slide here. Uh, when asked, I would pay more for a vehicle with autonomous features. The largest percentage did not agree with that. Okay, this is again all for just the older population, um, as well as questions that relate to um, if I, uh, I would prefer to be personally in control of my vehicle since autonomous technologies cannot be foolproof. Okay, the largest percentage agree with that comment. And so again, if we kind of keep moving along with the development and not thinking about why older adults kind of have resistance to the technology, then we're never going to be successful in this. Um, what are some implications? There's a lot more work that needs to be done in this space. These are only a few sample uh, studies. Uh, that I do know that there's some work that, uh, some ongoing work that's happening both in our lab and in other labs, but we need a lot more data to really understand what the issues are. And I'm, I'm excited to engage in conversation about this. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, I would I would suspect that those reservations of older people to use autonomous vehicles are probably shared by younger a lot of younger people <laughs> as well. So <laughs> it's definitely going to be a challenge uh, as these vehicles roll out. Um, so now we're going to move on to our last panelist, who is Robert Sparrow. He is a professor in the philosophy program and a chief investigator in the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Electromaterial Science at Monash University where he works on ethical issues raised by new technologies. He is a co-chair of the IEEE Technical Committee on Robot Ethics and was one of the founding members of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. So uh, Robert, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Sienna. Uh, so broadly speaking, my research program is to think about what resources political philosophy uh, and ethics can bring to debates about the future of transport. And I guess one of the first things I'd want to say there uh, is that we should be thinking about the future of transport and not developing autonomous vehicles. That those, you know, the project here isn't necessarily to make autonomous vehicles work, it's to develop a just and efficient transport system and which are the best technologies that we can use uh, to bring that about. I'm also interested in what new policy choices are made available uh, by uh, new technologies and also in some of my work, uh, what things might be taken off the table. So in a paper called uh, When Human Beings Are Like Drunk Robots, by uh, a co-authored paper uh, published in uh, Transport Research Part C back in 2017, uh, I argued that the, in any given role, if an autonomous system is uh, outperforms human beings when it comes to uh, injuries and casualties to third parties, uh, we shouldn't allow human beings to uh, uh, assume manual control of those vehicles. So it's a kind of driving should be, uh, manual driving should be illegal in the future if these technologies are fully realized. Uh, I, I think the sort of 
we're at a different point in the hype cycle now, and maybe people think that future is uh, further away. Uh, but even when people are considering autonomy in a constrained role, it seems to me uh, that if it's not better than human beings, it shouldn't be on the roads. If it is better than human beings, uh, we shouldn't be on the roads. And, and, and I think it's interesting to think about how these technologies might take some policy options off the table uh, as well. Uh, I guess I'm also interested in expanding conversations about equity. And one thing I always wonder is why we're we talking about equity and not social justice. It, it seems to me that equity is in some ways a more comfortable uh, framing precisely because it's a less political uh, framing. And that if we foreground concept of social justice, it immediately becomes obvious that um, uh, sometimes social justice requires that we treat uh, people differently, uh, particularly in the context of um, historical injustice and existing social uh, injustices. The idea that we should just treat everybody the same actually isn't uh, going to bring anything uh, like uh, equity. So I think it's useful here to uh, consider two different ways in which people do frame conversations about social justice. Uh, one is through the framing of equal uh, consideration of interests. Uh, you know, what equity means is we consider everybody's interests equally, and that may sometimes mean treating people differently. That framing foregrounds the possibility of compromise. You know, we're all gonna be able to work this out. We all express our interests and the transport system uh, works for all of us. There's another framing, which is a framing of equal rights, and that foregrounds uh, the possibility of conflict. Rights are something that you deploy in social contestation, and it's possible that we need to keep arguing uh, about these, uh, these issues. I also think it's important, um, if not popular, uh, to issue a cautionary note about the use of markets uh, in the context of the pursuit of equity. And when we frame these issues in terms of equal consideration of interests, uh, we say everyone's got an equal right to bid for transport or to pay for the transport uh, that they need. Uh, but absent rough equality of wealth, um, willingness of pay is a poor signal of consumer desires or consumer needs. And when people think that it's fair or just um, that people who are massively wealthier than others can outcompete them for scarce social goods, it's typically because they have a background assumption about the merit of the existing distribution of wealth uh, that it simply seems indefensible uh, to me uh, nowadays. The moment we rely on markets to distribute uh, some goods, we're allowing that um, the trivial desires of the ultra wealthy uh, should be prioritized over the deep needs of the poor. Uh, and that seems to me uh, highly problematic uh, when one is talking about social justice. Um, it's also, I think, absolutely crucial, and this is something that I think the transport, uh, urban planning and transport policy literature gets more right than most is to recognize that markets actually rely on regulation. They rely on uh, infrastructure and on public investment in order to exist at all. Uh, that you need regulation, you need contract law, even to define the goods uh, that you are trading. Uh, and what the, why this is important to think about uh, and I guess we can see it when people start talking about pricing the real costs of transport or trying to you know, build the externalities into the pricing of transport. There's no non-political way to do that. There's inevitably a set of political debates about uh, you know, what we think needs to be built into the price. Uh, and that means that markets aren't an alternative uh, to regulation. They're actually a product of it. And this is an argument that I developed with a co-author in a paper called um, Make Way for the Wealthy, uh, Autonomous Vehicles, Markets in Mobility uh, and Social Justice, which came out in a social geography journal called Mobilities uh, late last year, uh, where we uh, argued that um, when it comes to new opportunities to price transport using connected autonomous vehicles, the uh, 
we need to foreground these um, political questions uh, about what we want a transport system to do and what we're hoping a market will achieve. I guess the other thing I feel passionate about is that um, debates about equity or debates about social justice are much broader than people typically um, uh, uh, represent or understand when they talk just about who gets access to transport. Now, obviously, that's, in, that's important that uh, people have equitable access uh, to transport. And that means not just uh, different types of people, but it means different geographical areas. It means different routes. Uh, it means choice of mode when that's important uh, to people. But it also, conversations about equity must include things like the nature of the imagined user, something that Erin foregrounded uh, in her presentation. Uh, who do we imagine using these um, technologies? What do those imaginings imply for the way they're designed and how the design might exclude people? Uh, if your autonomous taxi uh, can't help you get your bag into the car, that's going to exclude a lot of people from, um, from using it. So imagining the skills and capacities uh, of users turns out to be a key place where assumptions relevant to equity are disguised. I also think we need to look at impacts on non-users. Uh, transport has pr transport and urban infrastructure has loads of implications for people more broadly that we need to be considering. We also need to be looking at intergenerational equity. What choices are we locking in when we continue with motor vehicles instead of trains or bicycles? Uh, what costs are we imposing on the future? What do we make impossible? And then finally, we need to also be talking about who gets to design new technologies and who gets to participate in conversations like this. So debates about equity are ubiquitous and that's something I'm trying to foreground in my work. Okay, well, thank you so much, Robert. And uh, I just wanna thank you, especially given that it's apparently midnight in Melbourne. So I uh, appreciate you staying up uh, late. Um, and, you know, I, I think your presentation was particularly interesting. It reminds me of the work of Carl Polanyi on, you know, the role of markets and their relationship to regulation. Uh, and, and I think it, you know, it's certainly something that applies to transportation, but also all fields of interest. Um, so I did actually want to continue with you uh, directly, Robert. Um, you know, you, you've written a lot about this market in mobility, um, which may be an economically efficient way of allocating access to the transportation system in general but it also poses ethical and political challenge, challenges with regards to who has access, such as prioritizing the mobility of the wealthy, as you pointed out in your presentation. So how do we create a transportation system that's a democratic space where everyone has access? And are there alternative approaches to pricing or to regulation that can make a, a more democratic and equitable or perhaps social justice oriented transportation network? Look, I like framing it as a question of democracy because I, I simply think that brings a different um, set of evaluation criteria. And, that, and I mean, one of the interesting things about connected autonomous vehicles uh, is the possibility that we can start pricing access to the road network um, at, at a much finer grain of detail. You know, we can say if you're traveling at nine o'clock, you know, in the morning and you want to go into the CBD, this is what it's going to cost you. If you want to get there extra quickly, we can give other people less advantageous, keep people out of your way uh, by giving them different images on Google Maps or by making the traffic lights work differently uh, with them. So there's a, there is a real opportunity here to pursue the efficiencies that markets make available. Um, the problem is that I think we have thought of space as... Uh, particularly public space as democratic space, uh, where we don't think uh, that people should have differential access to it. Now, obviously, that's been realised imperfectly. You know, there's loads of walled off spaces, luxury hotels where poor people uh, can't move. I mean, it's not like we have this world without walls or barriers to uh, participation. Uh, but I, I do think we can expect a certain amount of public backlash against the idea that the entirety of the road network is now going to have this invisible infrastructure designed to make it easier for 
wealthy people to get places uh, quickly. Um, but I, I want to recognise that markets have value here. And that's why the question is about the what do you price in? I mean, what you know, uh, is it the social exclusion can be considered a cost, uh, for instance, and typically attempts to sort of extend road pricing actually recognise that by promising to reinvest some of the you know, road tax into social justice uh, programs. Uh, so I don't think I have any sort of wonderful magic answers uh, to that, but I do want to foreground that there is a democratic moment here that people uh, miss when they move too quickly towards the efficiency, uh, you know, they're lured too quickly by the efficiency of the market. And that even if we do say, right, we want a market solution, that's the beginning of a political debate. It's not an alternative to politics. People often think it's, pol you know, it's dem democracy versus the market, but the market exists in a democratic space, in a political space. And the conversations we need to have about what gets priced are essentially uh, political. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, it's not kind of one or the other, it's going to be both, it seems to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I would add that, you know, in my own research, what I've found is that, you know, that political conversation has to occur not only at the national level where we're talking about AV regulations, but at every local government and uh, in the metropolitan level. And so from that perspective, I'm going to actually turn to Jackie um, to talk about her work on metropolitan planning organizations. But before I do that, I just want to say quickly that if audience members have questions, feel free to input them into the Q&A and we can uh, discuss those as well, but I'll go ahead and um, move to Jackie. So you spoke about some of your work on metropolitan planning organizations, which are the sort of regional bodies that are supposed to determine transportation priorities in the United States. Um, but you found that actually social equity was not really a major issue that they were considering with relationship to um, vehicle autonomy. So why is it that you think that the interest in social equity at the metropolitan level, at least, is so rare? And what are some of the means that might generate more interest on that? Yeah, so I think that um, the panelists have all touched on a few of the reasons, I think. So um, especially when I was conducting this study, these plans were completed now like four or five years ago. And I think the space has changed a lot since um, I did this research. And I think we know Kind of a lot more we're less slightly less optimistic for for the better about autonomous vehicles and the potential that they have um and so i realistically think there weren't a lot of resources for these um kind of planning agencies at the time there wasn't a lot of research out there and what i was seeing was just a lot of optimism about um oh these are going to be beneficial for people who can't currently drive and it's like well no like not without kind of retrofitting or designing these vehicles for that purpose kind of as Aaron was saying um, and, and also as Brandon was saying about older adults, like we all use these, um, kind of differently. We all have different expectations and levels of trust. And so I think there was kind of a hesitancy to be saying anything negative about these. And so there wasn't really much of a nuanced discussion about kind of what are some of the equity implications and even in terms of the pricing. So if we're going for kind of more mobility as a service or shared, Kind of what do we do with issues of kind of unbanked or underbanked um, populations and so i think i'm i'm hoping that moving forward we're going to see more kind of planning agencies taking these things into account as we get more research but um and kind of a better understanding of kind of all of these equity issues with transportation and that's a lot of what my research hopes to do is to provide planners with resources that they can use in making some of the decisions about kind of transportation projects that they want to prioritize but realistically, I think it's kind of understanding how kind of equity or especially justice, I think we're talking about and social justice is a, a difficult topic for a lot of organizations too, is kind of a component to all of these decisions that we make. And so we have to be thinking about it because um, when we're not thinking about it, we're inevitably harming somebody. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think it's often easy to resort, I mean, to focusing on the market as some sort of decider when in reality, as Robert pointed out, it's, you know, it is the product of our own decisions. So that's interesting um, context. So I want to move on to Aaron, um, who is actually working on the deployment of some of these vehicles. And I would love to understand the degree to which you're running into obstacles in making your autonomous shuttles or your autonomous fleet 
available to people from all backgrounds. You know, obviously people have a wide variety of access based on their income, their age, their physical abilities. Are there features of your transportation system or the transportation as a whole that make addressing certain of these inequities more or less difficult? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I think that what we found is, um, you know, through just, just talking to, to people who um, have disabilities, uh, people who work with, um, you know, members of the population who are unbanked or, you know, don't have access to smartphones. Um, I think that that it's really crucial to think about how we imagine this future that um, ever, people with, with a range of different abilities and um, financial capabilities are, are included. Um, and I, I think that what we found is that some uh, solutions to um, uh, to people with disabilities with various disabilities are kind of at odds with each other. Um, someone who has a uh, visual impairment or hearing impairment may require some kind of, you know, brighter screen with um, graphics or or sounds, you know, describing like how how you should uh, enter the vehicle when it's okay to exit. Um, but someone with a cognitive disability may may find that overwhelming and and really uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, Brandon mentioned uh, the, the older population, you know, people maybe are, are not really, really uh, uh, open to, to using this like new, new types of technology, you know, if everything is voice activated or everything is touchscreen, you know, um, I think we've all had our problems with our own uh, uh, virtual assistants, you know. <laughs> um, but I, I think that uh, as far as actual vehicle features go, um, something that that we've found because May Mobility does not make our own vehicles, um, we have to uh, go through a chain of suppliers, you know, for for people to add a drive-by wire capability to the vehicle, um, adding our computer and all of our sensors. Um, and so it's it's also on us to do the research and actual fabrication of features to add to the vehicle to make it accessible. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, as, like I mentioned, as we've seen companies invest billions of dollars into, you know, making their own purpose-built AVs, um, we've seen uh, kind of a lack of prioritization of accessibility features. Um, and I, I think that, you know, moving forward as the AV industry changes and, you know, maybe uh, companies are consolidated, I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, we're able to, um, you know, encourage more companies to to have these conversations, to think about this now rather than later. Because, you know, as a company who is who is adding additional features to vehicles, um, it's it's much more difficult to do it that way than to just start fresh. Yeah, and actually, Aaron, I I, I think this is a huge problem because much of the proponents much of the argument that proponents of AVs make is that it's going to solve problems related to accessibility, problems related to aging, problems related to the youth, people who don't have access to the traditional car-based driving transportation system. And yet at the same time, you're telling us that there's like inherent problems going on with the discussion in the, in the AV marketplace. So I want to move on to Brandon from that perspective um, to tell us a little bit more about what he thinks about how AVs can actually start to address those problems. I mean, you've talked about the fact that older adults are reticent to use these technologies, but maybe what Aaron's telling us is that these technologies aren't even being designed for these people in mind in the first place. Yeah, so very good question. So one way is to include older adults in the conversation, right? Is to, and we see that that has been lacking. The disabled community, the older adult community, they've kind of been an afterthought when it comes to development. And so there's this push for making sure that, um, and there is this De US Department of Transportation uh, Inclusive Design Challenge. I know May Mobility is one of the, um, one of the semifinalists, so is Purdue. And one of the things that they are, that's almost a requirement is that you actually talk to stakeholders, is that you, you, you sit down at the table and you, you can do it, decide um, to do it at whatever phase of the development process you want, but we believe that it's better that you do it at all phases before it's designed, while it's being designed and when it's designed, right? That, that you get in this continuous feedback. Um, so that, that's one thing. But the other thing is to really understand and lean into this idea of custom customization. 
sometimes psychologists, psychologists tell us that if you give people too many options, that might be worse than not enough options, right? Um, and, but, but some of the work that we've done in our lab has actually looked at, so Aaron talked a little bit about um, kind of input modalities. So using speech or, or uh, touch to communicate with the vehicle, but the vehicle can also communicate with the user um, through visual icons, through auditory or speech-based messaging, through vibrotactile alerts. Um, and so the more that we can kind of think about, okay, here, here is this segment, right? Here is someone who, um, uh, who is blind or visually impaired, right? They may be able to benefit from an auditory and a vibrotactile alert. How do I structure that? But not only how do I structure it, how do I do it in a way that, that fits their particular need, right? So, it, so it's really kind of creating these adaptive interfaces that says, when I need it, the information is there, but when I feel that it's annoying, right? The vehicle, if it's intelligent enough to drive itself, it should be intelligent enough to, to, to sense like the types of information that I need, when I, the timing that I need it, right? The frequency at which I need it, the intensity. Um, and so you can use eye tracking, for example, heart rate monitoring, kind of these psychophysiological measures to, to understand context, right? And then adjust information presentation based on what the system has has determined right and so so i think that's that so my answer to the question is that we include people in the conversation in the beginning and then we think about how do we capitalize on these customizable displays um, that present information to people based on context Brandon and Aaron, I know <laughs> I, I know there are good institutional reasons for you to frame the, the questions this way, but it is striking that your conception of of the you know at the beginning uh, has already left as already assuming autonomy, autonomous vehicles. That the conversation is about you know how can we get an autonomous vehicle to work for you, and I mean you know if the transportation department is making these design challenges. Fair enough, but there are other questions like, would you prefer a more regular bus service, or could we, you know, redesign our urban communities uh, so that people don't need to travel so far to essential services? I mean, there's a broader set of questions about transport and about public infrastructure here that sort of get left out when people say we need to consult with stakeholders about design because they assume that we know what people want us to be designing. And, and if it was a broader conversation, many people say, look, actually, I like talking to the bus driver or I like, you know, the social contacts that I get from people, uh, people in taxis. And what I'd like is a cheaper taxi service or, you know, or any number of other options. So it's just, you know, it's just important to recognise that uh, how can we make this technology work for you is not the beginning of the consultation. That's already, we're already several steps down when we, we start there. Absolutely. I, um, Aaron or Brandon, do you have any, uh, do you want to respond? It's okay if you, you don't have any thoughts, but you feel free. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I did just want to touch on that um, because, you know, like, like you, I think uh, I'm, I'm for transit, I'm for, you know, more uh, regular bus service, more options for transportation. Um, I think that autonomous vehicles can be part of the transportation solution moving forward, um, you know, in, provi in providing a piece of, of the puzzle of uh, the future of transportation. Um, however, I, I think that, um, you know, making autonomous vehicles uh, work for everyone now and uh, demonstrating their use in, you know, encouraging adoption of shared transportation, encouraging um, transportation independence, uh, I think is important to emphasize now before we get to the point where autonomous vehicles are only being offered through private sales uh, as individual car ownership. You know, um, the more that we talk about this now as the transportation is beginning to evolve, um, the more people can kind of understand and, and see uh, autonomous vehicles as a shared transportation service rather than something that is only available to people who can afford a vehicle with um, these features.
Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on to some of the uh, audience questions that we're getting. And I would uh, recommend, you know, we still have another 10 minutes. So if any of the attendees want to uh, provide questions in the Q&A, feel free to add them. But um, one anonymous attendee, I guess people's names are not included here, uh, asked whether um, any of these technologies have been adopted in rural areas. And I would just expand that question to ask whether there are differential equity considerations to be talking about in urban versus rural areas. I think, you know, at least I have a tendency to, to really focus in on uh, autonomous technologies as providing, for example, the options for ride hailing or, or things of that sort that really work in, in dense urban areas. But are they relevant to rural areas? And what are the sort of uh, compromises that have to be discussed when talking about autonomous vehicles in rural areas? Yeah, so uh, happy happy to just jump in and kind of give our, our view on uh, AVs and rural transportation. Um, this is something that we, we've been looking into because, you know, we're trying to avoid this future where in cities there's plentiful uh, transportation options and ways to get around, but then as soon as you leave, you know, you're, you're, you're forced to, to drive a, a personal vehicle. Um, we've also talked to a lot of people with disabilities who do live in rural areas and rely on, you know, paratransit for, for everything, um, grocery, seeing friends, um, and the, the flexibility of options with, with paratransit in rural areas is just not, not great for a lot of people. Um, you know, service hours are, are short, um, maybe it doesn't, it's expensive, uh, so May Mobility at least sees uh, autonomous vehicles as you know, something that, that should be deployed everywhere, um, that there's a transportation need. So I'll jump in as well. Um, so here in Indiana, uh, which I would say more than 50% of the state is, is rural, um, we're not actually working in the space, but there are conversations being had about accessibility. Um, but one of the things that we find in our own research whenever we bring older adults to the lab, and if we reached out to, to rural communities for participation, a lot of the conversations that we're having with older adults is just introducing them first to what an autonomous vehicle is, right? There are a lot of people that have this conception that it's binary, it's either all or nothing, right? It's manual or it's fully autonomous. And so a lot of what, we, and this is not, um, I'm not sliding any, you know, any, any population, but what we've seen is that when there are oftentimes when there are people from a rural community who um, who come to our lab and they're not as knowledgeable about these technologies, the first step is really just having to sit down and explain to them, okay, here are the six levels, here's what they mean, here's, you know, and, and talk through examples to at least get them familiarized with that, right? And so, um, like I say, we're not doing work in the area, but that's something that we've seen is an issue. So how do we kind of market these, make sure that commercials, there was a new commercial about WebEx that just came out yesterday uh, that I saw this weekend, right? Um, and they're talking about new features that are coming up. And I wanna say, well, we're not seeing those same kind of commercials necessarily um, happening for autonomous vehicles. We're seeing it for advanced, drive, uh, advanced driver assistance systems, right? So you see someone, um, you know, someone is running out in front of the vehicle and the vehicle automatically stops, right? or someone is backing out of the driveway and it, it applies the brakes. We're seeing that, but we're not seeing a lot of marketing happening or happening around explaining to just the general public descriptions about these different levels of autonomy. So, I mean, I'd like to point out, this is another great example of a kind of where markets will serve rural populations really poorly uh, that, you know, rural transport relies on a massive subsidy from more populated areas, and that seems appropriate uh, to me. But it's one of the places where you actually get a much broader spectrum of people understanding that there's a limit to markets because, you know, large conservative constituencies that will be very poorly served if we just deploy these systems where they're obviously profitable. I guess the other thing that rural case... Um, highlights is the the questions around something like the right to repair or, or the 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 values played by you know needing to be able to tinker with, with your vehicle that some of the assumptions that we have about technological infrastructure that these things will just drive back to the depot and get repaired work 
less well in rural contexts, and particularly if these are privately owned autonomous vehicles, then people are going to want to be able to attach weird machines to them and they're going to want to be able to uh, use them in different weather conditions and they're going to want to be able to exercise control over them that I think some of the urban use scenarios people aren't really thinking about that sort of user modification of vehicles. Yeah, and I'll add from a from like a planning perspective. So I've have been looking at a lot of smaller MPOs, and I just think that again, this leads back to kind of investment and funding that there's just not as much consideration from a planning perspective, which I think already puts them on the back foot. Um, and when when we're thinking about power transit as well, there are a whole host of issues, and I know that um, that and they just get compounded when we think about rural areas as well. So I think that that's definitely an area that kind of needs more attention. Great. So we actually have this this interesting comment from um, Shane McKenzie in the in the Q and A, who's talking about uh, this question of you know the difference between um, markets and democracy, which I think has sort of underscored much of, of the conversation that we've had here. Um, and I would just like to you know offer all the panelists an opportunity at the conclusion of this conversation uh, to talk about what you see as the key conversations we need to be having over the next five years on AVs. How do we make sure that we are able to address the extreme social injustice that occurs in our societies at large, but also uh, you know, improve them through perhaps better transportation technologies or, or better options in the transportation sector in general? So I'm going to leave it up to you all to give us some, some thoughts on that. And uh, I'll begin with, with Jackie. Um, uh, and so I guess, I guess what we can do kind of moving forward, um, from kind of my limited knowledge so far, um, I guess is, I think we have to be consider considering what our goals are more generally. And I think Robert spoke to this about kind of where do autonomous vehicles and all of these technologies realistically fit into our transportation system that we shouldn't just be kind of making investments because there's something new and shiny that we should be realistically thinking about kind of what the future is and how these fit in. And I think we should do that first before kind of just going forward and then trying to kind of retrofit equity into it. So, because I think that having that conversation up front about what we want our transportation system to look like, um, especially with all of these communities that have previously been kind of harmed or underserved by transportation, um, is, is really the first step in, to, in terms of increasing accessibility, um, kind of going towards a more just transportation system. Erin? Yeah, um, I, I think that I, I want to focus on, you know, what, what questions should we be asking for the, for the next five years or so. Um, and this is, uh, you know, kind of related to this hype cycle that we've, we've talked about, you know, when a, when a new autonomous vehicle is released, there's a ton of press and, you know, it's like, wow, look at this you know, shared mobility uh, vehicle. Um, but I, I think it's really important to contextualize those um, kind of news pieces um, and and releases uh, and think about, you know, who is this being made for? And who is consulted in the designing of this? And when and where will this be deployed? Um, because if, if we see, you know, th these vehicles are only being designed for use in, um, urban areas by, you know, working professionals um, that that leaves a lot of people out of the conversation. So it's it's just just remembering this when when we're seeing this hype cycle of of uh, you know related to AVs. Um, they do have the potential, I believe, to to help people, um, but but we need to keep that in mind as we are, um, you know, consuming our news. Brandon. Yes, um, so I would say we need to really acknowledge the psychology behind all of this and understand that even though just a year ago we were forced to kind of transition, I think all of us are at home still right now in the 13th month. Um, I think we need to really understand human psychology and, and, and what implication that has for everything autonomous vehicle plus, right? So. Um, you know, some people are saying that they're zoomed out. Some people, you know, uh, pe people are kind of ready to go back into work. They thought that, oh, you know what, working from home would be a nice thing to, to do. And then and now that they've been there 13 months, they're finding that that's not, that that's not, that may not be feasible. 
And I think we need to look at autonomous vehicles with the same with the same approach and not necessarily force it down people's throat. Um, right, people are resistant to rap, they're resistant to rapid change. And so I really think we need to think strategically about how do we kind of incrementally help society evolve rather than unplugging everything and saying we're going to start all over work's going to be new driving's going to be new right all all things above will be new so just wanted to add that great and finally robert so i'm not sure that the other panelists have left me much to much to say because they all said it uh said it so well uh, i mean I, I guess i think that what i like about talking about autonomous vehicles is it's an opportunity to think very radically about the future of, of transport but then i think what needs to happen is that when you're having that radical conversation you ask yourself i mean are cars part of the story for for a start you know maybe we should be looking at public transport and bicycles trains and bikes uh, what other things could, if we're going to think about redesigning everything and making all this magical kit, what else could we, uh, what else could we be doing rather than just thinking I'm going to improve, you know, the the vehicle in my garage and make it so it drives it, uh, drives itself. Um, and then I guess I, I, I always want people to be conscious of the way that the excitement about the technology can sometimes be at the expense of the sophistication about the conversation about what we really need. You know, people love talking about technology and you can make clear progress and some technologies really are better than other technologies. But the, the deep questions we need to be asking are these questions about the nature of social justice, the future we want to build together, and they're hard conversations. And so we need to be careful that because we like the new gear, that we don't let our excitement about that sort of crowd out our willingness to, um, you know, think deeply about what kind of world we want to build. Okay, well, I would really like to thank all of our panelists. Uh, it was a great conversation, and I'm really excited about learning more about all the work that you all are doing. Um, we are slightly over time, and I will pass it back to uh, whomever the right person is on, on that. <laughs>